Welcome to Georgia's Fantastic Tavern, where Europe meets Asia. I'm the artistic director, Maya Jaggi, live in London, bringing you this online festival with Writers' House of Georgia in Tbilisi and partners the British Library and Words Without Borders in New York. The festival starts today on the centenary of the Soviet occupation of Georgia, when the capital Tbilisi fell to the Red Army in 1921. The invasion not only ended Georgia's short-lived democratic republic, it also doomed an entire artistic avant-garde. The capital, Tbilisi, had welcomed writers and artists of many nationalities fle fleeing the Russian civil wars, including the future Dr. Zhivago author Boris Pasternak. The cafe culture that embraced them was cosmopolitan, multi-ethnic, experimental and free with women as artists, not only muses, and where different art forms spoke to each other, as I hope they will at this festival. Though it's created obviously for the pandemic era, Georgia's Fantastic Tavern had its origins four years ago in Tbilisi when the artist Levan Shogoshvili, who you'll see in the video after this talk, inspired me to visit the Rustaveli Theatre's closed basement to see the modernist wall paintings in what had been the Kimerioni Cafe. The theatre let me in and Stepko's Tavern by Lado Gudiashvili is now the festival banner. On an earlier visit, I'd seen at Writer's House an impossibly long row of photographs of writers who were executed in Stalin's purges, reminiscent to me of the doomed youth of Britain's First World War poets. That moment also led to this festival. And to me, this is not only Georgia's history, but it's an important part of 20th century world history. And thanks to Writer's House, Georgia's Fantastic Tavern and our supporters, some of those portraits and artworks are now in an online picture gallery seen by many today on the Guardian's homepage. Finally, this is a sequel to Where Europe Meets Asia, Georgia 25, Britain's first festival of Georgian writers, which I had the pleasure of curating in London five years ago for the Georgian National Book Centre. Warm thanks to my associates at Writers' House, including Natalia Lomori, Maya Danelia, Nino Nadibaidze, and Salome Matlakalidze. There are two days of British Library events and two alternate days of Tavern Encounters streaming on YouTube and Facebook. There are also newly translated extracts of four festival novelists on the free to access wordswithoutborders.org. All details can be found at georgesfantastictavern.com. In today's double bill, after my live talk with Nino Harachishvili, a video introduction to Georgia's First Republic takes us inside the former Kimerioni Cafe and the National Gallery in Tbilisi before the talk, Liberty's Feast and Hangover. But first of all, some very brief welcome words and a song from Katie Melua. The political and cultural surge of the First Republic of Georgia is a nostalgic icon that haunts our imaginations since then. The small window of independence from 1918 to 1921 might have been the only period in the history of the country when all spheres of art were synchronic vis-a-vis -vis artistic processes in the world. The Georgian avant-garde was born and bloomed during those years. Symbolist poets and artists made Tbilisi Paris of Orient. It was a period of uh, artistic explosion, but also of political and educational revival. These were the years of great expectations, expectations that we could finally break free and become a nation. This vision lasted only for three years and was doomed to fail in the face of Russian occupation in 1921. Today, 100 years later, Georgia still faces this very challenge and 20% of our country is still under Russian forces. What very few might know is that we face the creeping occupation on a daily basis in some 60 kilometers from Tbilisi. The Georgian writers, participants of this wonderful festival, will bring the image of Georgia, a vibrant, polyphonic and deeply artistic country in Caucasus with extraordinary literary traditions, turbulent history, great winemaking and feasting traditions, and a sentimental reminiscence of culture of avant-garde taverns and art cafes of beautiful, now fading Tbilisi. 
Literature is a perfect medium for conversation between people, even countries. We hope that the festival Georgia's Fantastic Tavern will be a medium that will bring Georgia closer to interested readers. I would like to thank all our partners who supported us to create such a memorable experience, especially the British Library and the online magazine for international literature in New York, Words Without Borders, and of course, wonderful Maya Jaggi, whose love and dedication to Georgia made all this possible. I am thrilled to welcome you all to this wonderful online festival of Georgian writers, which is a real sparkle and celebrates the rich Georgian culture and literature, especially during some challenging times. The Embassy of Georgia is very pleased to both support and promote such a brilliant event. I would like to thank the organizers and partners of the festival, the Writers' House of Georgia, the British Library, Words Without Borders, and of course the artistic director, Maya Jaggi, for making it happen. It is noteworthy that the Literary Festival marks the centenary of the Soviet invasion of Georgia and the 30th anniversary of regaining its independence, a significant period for Georgia's democratic transformation on its Euro-Atlantic integration path. Furthermore, this festival offers a fantastic platform to introduce some of the most renowned Georgian authors of recent years to a global English-speaking audience. And now I would like you to enjoy a brilliant performance of a renowned British Georgian singer, Katie Melua. I thank you and wish you all a very interesting continuation of the festival, which I'm sure will be full of fruitful and illuminating discussions. To <laughs> Rad ver gam chnevdi yau imadrom si qvaruli stuis kuli ar gam iri yau imadrom si qvaruli stuis kuli ar gam iri yau achla swame bareshem khda. Aller sit kama bniao, tkvila tats mami kurgura, kalta zed damarziao, tkvila tats mami kurgura, kalta zed damarziao. Tu aset urpai kavi. Rad ver gam chnevdi yau Imad rom si gavaru listuis Guli ar gam iri yau Imad rom si gavaru listuis Guli ar gam iri yau Imad rom si gavaru Twist, coolly, Argami, Katie, thank you for opening Georgia's Fantastic Tavern with a song in Georgian. We look forward to welcoming you back tomorrow for our conversation on your songwriting. But first, this online festival of Georgian writers takes place over the next four days. Will you be watching some of the other events and why do you think people should come along? Um, well, thank you so much for having me along. And I am, you know, I'm glad for your question. I'm genuinely so excited about this event. Um, I know particularly after our, talk, our brief talk just now, there's going to be the writer of the brilliant Eighth Life book. Um, now, and I quickly just want to tell you something about this book. I was in Germany um, at the end of summer uh, last year, 2020. I was promoting my latest record. And uh, there's a radio DJ um, who wouldn't let me leave the building without him going to get his copy of Eighth Life because he was saying, this is the most incredible book. It's taken everyone in the German media world by storm. We're all reading it, we're all obsessed with it. 
and he was like it's pretty all of it is pretty much set in Georgia and it's written by a brilliant Georgian writer and I'm afraid to say I hadn't heard of it before but through him I was able to get it and so that's why I'm so excited that this is you know this is happening now. Well thank you so much and we will see you in the digital tavern on Friday tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. you can hear the rest of my interview with Katie Melloa in Birth of a Songwriter, streaming tomorrow at 1800 GMT. Now I'm delighted that Nino Haratishvili joins us live from Berlin after that introduction. An acclaimed novelist, playwright and theatre director, she was born in Georgia in 1983 and moved to Germany some 20 years later. She writes in both German and Georgian. The Eighth Life for Brilke, which you've just heard about, published in German in 2014, is a bestseller in several languages, including Georgian, and its many awards include the Bertolt, Bertolt Brecht Prize. The English version by Charlotte Collins and Ruth Martin, published by Scribe, won last year's Warwick Prize for Women in Translation and is out in paperback. It's the saga of six generations of the Jashi family, from Stasia, an aspiring dancer who marries a white guard turned red lieutenant, and their daughter Kitty, who becomes a dissident singer-songwriter in Britain, to Nitza, the narrator in Germany, who is writing all this down for her 12-year-old niece, Brilke. This beautiful puzzle of family history is arranged in eight books that range from St. Petersburg and Tbilisi to Berlin and London, and infused with a ch chocolate recipe as accursed as it is addictive. The novel has been hailed as a Georgian war and peace, but the sweep of history in this red century that cheated and deceived everyone is viewed with a very cool 21st century eye. After our conversation, there'll be time for some of your questions, so do send them in. Nino, welcome to the tavern. Thank you. I'm so glad um, that I've been invited, and um, yes, yeah, thanks for having me here. We're delighted you're here. You, you've said that when you moved to Germany in 2003, nobody knew where Georgia was. And there's an exchange in the novel in a London pub where Amy... Um, says she thinks Georgia is somewhere in Russia and Kitty tells her very dryly, no, it's in Georgia. I wondered, has that been your experience as a Georgian outside Georgia? And has this 900 page novel, which I have here, this <laughs> tome of a book, ha has it changed that? I mean, it would be a little bit overconfident to say that my novel changed the fact that people got more interested in to I mean in my country but um, yes the fact is it is so I mean in Germany um, when I moved to Germany it was like the same I also been asked the same question where is it do you speak Russian is it something like somewhere Eastern Europe, but people didn't know much about it. And um, it changed in the last years. Um, I'm realizing while talking with people, also readers. Um, and of course, I'm always happy to hear uh, people um, telling me that they went to Georgia after reading this novel. But I guess it's not only about this book. I think there are a lot of Georgian artists. I mean, <laughs> we... Um, listen to the wonderful Katie Melua, but also a lot of writers, a lot of filmmakers, a lot of musicians who um, who are contributed to that, that Georgia becomes kind of more popular and people got more interested in it. And I think culture, I think, yeah, it's, it's the main key for that because it's a direct way. It's about emotions and uh, you catch up this fire and it's like the maybe the most direct way to uh, got into something or maybe even fall in love. So um, yes, I would be happy if I like, of course I do like the idea to um, contribute it a little bit to the fact that people um, go to Georgia and are like interested in that country. But I think it depends on so many different um, factors and people. Of course, it's like about the devotion of these people and artists. I do believe so. 
Um, you also said some people are not sure where, which language um, is spoken in Georgia. And of course, as we know, this is a separate language with even a separate alphabet. And I wondered when you write in German, are you also drawing on the Georgian language in, in some way in your writing and also the very rich Georgian literature, which dates from the fifth century? I guess so. Of course, it's not a conscious process, but uh, every time while I um, start the editing process of a new book, uh, my editors or my publisher is um, keeping talking, keeping repeating that it's somehow a Georgian German. And um, of course, my style or my way of writing is influenced by my mother language. And I think it's also it's an emotional approach that people often, um, I mean, before the eight life, I've been often also criticized because in Germany, it's a, like, a, it's a problematic issue. Um, it's this uh, direct or maybe even pathetic way of dealing with emotions, kind of not ironic and um, not like this postmodern. Um, but of course, it's nothing that I'm, I'm not sitting and like thinking about every word and how I would say it in Georgian and then translating in German. It's something that it happens like it's not really, I'm not aware of it all the time. But um, yes, I mean, this is where I start. This are my roots. And of course, somehow it's, um, I'm completely like influenced by that. And in order to write about the 1990s, um, which is the period that you grew up in, in Georgia, you had to start with the Russian Revolution um, and Georgia's first republic, which came the, the following year. Can you explain why you had to do that? Why that long view? And also, what does today's centenary of the Soviet occupation mean to you? Um. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Why did I have to start so <laughs> early? I mean, um, first of all, I had a lot of questions. Um, it was um, in the first, in the beginning, I mean, the first years when I um, came to Germany, I didn't really look back. I wanted to assimilate. I wanted to um, find like um, a, a new life, a new place. Um, uh, a new way of expressing things. But after some years, I realized that it's not possible to go on and um, if you don't turn back. So I had a lot of questions and I think that the whole thing started with this questions or maybe the main question, uh, why would you keep repeating things again and again? Um, and when I started, I've tried to focus because I knew, okay, I want to write a novel about a family, a Georgian family, about a, a period in Georgian history when I grew up. And it was a really challenging time. I mean, every Georgian remembers this um, really cruel and terrible um, time, dark time, time full of violence and brutality and economical and social crises and so on. Um, but I realized that nobody from outside uh, would understand what it was about and why things were happening the way they were happening. Um, not even me, because um, I knew, okay, all that happened, but where did they start and why it came this way? I also didn't have the answers. So I started to travel back somehow and dig a little bit deeper. And I had no idea where I would end up and then I ended up at the October Revolution. And of course, at that point, I thought, okay, oh my God, what I'm doing here, uh, it's going to be a really, really huge, <laughs> huge thing, huge journey. But at that point, I already was so much kind of into it that I couldn't stop. So that's why um, this book became so huge. But somehow, I mean, from the recent point, I'm really happy that I wasn't aware what I was doing and I didn't know um, which kind of process I would going be through. Because I think if I would uh, know all that, maybe I wouldn't dare. So, um, and what about the um, day to day? Yes, of course, it's an important one, really symbolic one. And it makes me somehow sad that we still, because we had some demonstrations recently and, um, that we still kind of 
deal with the Soviet heritage for the last 13 years, it didn't really broke through this vicious or cursed circle that I call it. Um, because yeah, things are keeping repeating and repeating and the same mistakes are coming back. And um, we are, I mean, all the younger people they showed on these demonstrations like yesterday and the day before that the only way is the only direction they want to go is towards Europe. And I was really kind of um, sentimental and sad because I saw some videos from these demonstrations and saw the banners and the posters and the main slogan was like, um, no way going back to the Soviet Union or returning back. And I think that is something that gives me some hope, but still, of course, a lot of problems, a lot of political and economical and social problems and uh, still there, still, um, it's like this heritage and the circle is, yeah, it, it's not broken through. So I think it's a long process. Yes, because one should say we're, we're, the festival happens to be in a week or within a couple of weeks when the prime ministers resigned, the opposition leader was arrested and the protesters, it's noticeable that a lot of people have noted the significance of the 1921 centenary and that, that these dates keep recurring and they're very much, they're not something that one imposes, but they're very much in, in, the, in the minds of people as they experience this tussle. somehow because and i'm i'm really it makes me mad and angry that the i mean the politicians it's almost ironic that in on the centenary and in, like in these days uh we are still dealing with um stuff like that and i mean this arrests being of course it's a political issue and um Yes, I mean, how I cannot really understand how, how they can do so, because, of course, people are more aware of their past. And that's what makes me really hopeful, because I see the generations changed and the younger ones are so much more aware of how, what it means to be a civil society and that every individual counts and we all have to, like, change things and not only waiting for a Messia, like once more, who comes and solves our, all our problems. Yeah. Okay, and um, I wanted to go back a little to the to the First Republic, um, which is you know the centenary is about the invasion, but but the festival is inspired by the art that, and the culture that preceded it. Um, some of your chapter epigraphs are by the Bluehorn poets, um, some of whom uh, are in the Guardian Picture Gallery that I mentioned. And Stasia finds this new poetry new to her at this time, incredibly beautiful. And her friend Sopio is herself a symbolist poet. I wondered, when did you become aware of the Bluehorn poets? And perhaps you could say a little about them. And also, why did you want to include them in the novel? I um, guess when I was in my teens, um, because um, maybe like with 15 or 16, I become more and more interested in poetry. I never wrote poems, <laughs> uh, never even dare, but I really admire some uh, of them. Um, and I was not really a fan of this traditional heroic, pathetic, um, a little bit, yeah, this national spirited um, Georgian poetry of like the 18th or 17th century. And um, it was kind of relief when I discovered the Blue Horn um, because it was something completely new and it was so much more daring and free spirited and the language was so beautiful and so experimental and it was not only about this I love my country and I'm this heroic stuff because um, that was a little bit annoying for me it was 15 or 16 and of course I was interested in like <laughs> completely different things um, yes it was a big 
um, I really fell in love with this um, completely different point of view on the way of so we're dealing with language. And of course, this also this kind of, um, I don't know the right word for it, but kind of daring maybe because they had some completely new issues, also much more eroticism and so on. And why I did include them, I mean, it was like, I have a lot of quotes and slogans in my book. It's like every chapter begins with one. And I guess it started because I was, when while I did my research, I uh, went to Moscow and um, there is, um, I don't remember in which museum or um, I've discovered there was an exhibition about Soviet posters. Um, of course, propaganda posters. And it was really shocking. And I started to uh, make pictures of them and collect them because um, it's so ironic and sarcastic because like, you know, the Soviet rocket was invented for the world peace or stuff like that and really cool things, but somehow also funny, but in a really dark way. And um, then I started to include them into the book, but um, at some point I realized that it's so kind of depressing. And when you read that without knowing really a lot about the time and the Soviet Union, one could think that it's been only gray and dark and terrible. But um, then I thought, okay, I have to, put some other stuff like an opposite of that propaganda um, quotes because there have been also so much great poets and writers and artists they created under really huge pressure and under such terrible circumstances so much beauty and I wanted to show that that it also did exist and that's why um, I think that I included this um, uh, quotes and uh, words um, into my book, yes. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I mentioned that the book has been compared, has been called a kind of Georgian war and peace, but it's not this 19th century omniscient narrative. And the narrator is pitting her imagination against the historical gaps that are left by state propaganda and trauma. I wondered what your approach was to filling those gaps, as a, those silences as a novelist um, that are left by official history and the distortion of history. And also, what was your approach to depicting historical characters? Because Stalin appears off stage, or he, he, he's the, the millionfold murderer. Um, but his henchman, Lavrenti Beria, is little big man in the novel, and he rapes Stasia's sister in a box at the opera. They're very present, these, these, this kind of evil um, in the novel. So how, how did you approach that history and those characters? I guess, I mean, the main tool for me um, was always been imagination. And in that particular case, um, especially, because of course there've been a lot of gaps and I could not still, I did a lot of research, but um, it remains an interpretation and um, it's I'm not a historian so for me it's um, it was important to um, kind of be free um, in my imagination of course there are a lot of facts and historical facts and all the stuff that I had to deal with but uh, this gaps what was the possibility to create literature otherwise I would not um, I would not dare to write like it's um, yeah it's I'm not a non-fiction writer so um, and I think um, what I mentioned before questions maybe that is the main um, uh, main issue about that main thing that we also missed as Georgians um, because I remember um, while we've been um, at school the a history lessons for years and years we had like chapters, uh, hundreds of chapters about medieval time and the golden age of uh, Georgian history and uh, King Tamara and, and so on and so on. But about the Soviet Union, it was only like one chapter. And um, this kind of analyze um, is never like the Germans did, for example, 
what they call Aufarbeitung, I would say maybe like a historical processing or something like that. I don't know what's the right word for it in English. Kind of analyze. Um, it never happened. And maybe because we, for the last 13 years, we've been like surviving and people didn't have the luxury for that. I can understand, but still it's really, really important. And I think it's not about answers, it's about questions. And when we start questioning things, um, we also are more and more forced to um, realize our mistakes. Because of course, Georgian as like every nation likes to see themselves only as a victim. And, um, uh, but it's not this way. It's not the only truth there is also like a completely different side of the history and the collaboration and so on and so on. So I think it's really, really important. And I don't think that I, because people often, readers often ask me that, okay, what did you, un, what was like the main things that you um, understood after writing this book or doing some, this big research. And I don't think it's about it because I am not wiser or kind of that I found my, all my answers. Um, of course I did not, but I became more aware of things. And um, this is maybe the, the only thing that of course also art or literature can do, or um, I can only speak um, about myself that I can do. And um, I think it's also important for us as a society. Mm. And Gunter Grass called it working through. I mean, this process of, of working through history, you never deal with it, but you process it continuously, I suppose. Yeah. Um, there was, Another part of my question, which was about Stalin and, and oh yes, <laughs> Stalin and Beria, and why Stalin remains off stage, and what what were your decisions about that? Um, that was uh, difficult because I wanted to avoid kind of um, psychological approach because I don't wanted to explain this persons because um, I'm not able to and not willing to. Uh, and I thought it's too simple, you know, to explain all this cruelty was okay. He wasn't loved um, when he was a kid and um, he wanted to write poems and he didn't become a writer. And that's why he punished like millions of people. I think it's like too black and white and too um, simple. Um, and for me, it was important to, um, find a way um, because in that case all the other characters they're fiction they're like I was completely free to um, form them and describe them and in that case I had to of course uh, it's difficult because I cannot reinvent these characters and um, uh, first of all I didn't name them that was helpful it was like you know in Harry Potter <laughs> when you're not allowed to speak out this um, name of the um, villain um, but in the end um, like on the last page in the book they're named and for me it was also a symbolic process that Nita the narrator of the book um, that she has to like go through all that and pass all that and um, yeah break through the circle um, and in the end it's a kind of joke um, and when you are able to smile about or laugh about everything, um, something, then it means they're not so powerful anymore. And that was something that I was aiming for or trying to do, um, the one thing. And the other, uh, what really helped me, I mean, Stalin is like more in the background. Um, he's like a god somewhere, um, like um, uh, the Olymp and ruling like everything in that book, but from the background. But the main, maybe more important or main character is Laurenti Beria, um, his right hand and the head of KGB and so on. Um, and um, of course I read everything I could find and um, tried to find as much information as I could to make a picture. But um, in the end, I decided to 
um, describe him from like female perspective, from somebody, um, from a different. Um, so it was helpful to describe him from outside, from somebody's point. Like um, it, in in uh, in that case, it was Christine, um, a woman. He gotten he forced her to have a love affair with her, and always trying to keep this distance, because yes, I really really wanted to avoid the psychological explanations um, because I did not really, oh, I do not really believe that they are um, helpful in that case. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned looking at Beria, who um, one should say if people don't know, both Stalin and Beria um, were, were Georgian and, and rose to the top of this, of this system. But um, most of the eight books in your book, In the Eighth Life, belong to women. And one of the most harrowing scenes, apart from what happens to Christine, there's another that happens to the narrator. She is sexually assaulted by a militiaman in the 1990s in the Civil War. I wondered why it was important for you to focus on women's inner lives, as you do in this novel. And also, do you see it as a kind of story of repeated thwarted creativity, which so many of these women who want to be dancers, who want to be singers and so on, there's a kind of a, an attrition, there's a waste of talent that happened mm -hmm. in the novel over generations. How, how do you see that? Um, I mean, of course, I'm, uh, for me, it's natural to write about women and to have this female uh, perspective because I am a woman. Um, and I did not really, it, I, I wasn't thinking about it for so long. I really got aware how kind of exceptional people think it is after the book has been published in Germany, it was 2014. And um, like almost every review was like accentuating or underlining this fact that it's like the main characters are female and it's so exceptional and so on. And in, in the beginning I thought, okay, it's a compliment, it's nice, it's great. But then somehow this fact made me a little bit angry because of course everyone was repeating strong women, strong women. And I thought, okay, that it means that strong women are exceptional. So what does it mean that women are always like weak or um, it's, um, so I, I thought about it a lot and um, it's, it's sad that it's not normal still. Um, and it, people think that it's really exceptional um, if you tell a story from a female point of view. Uh, and, um, but, of course, it was also a um, conscious decision because I wanted to tell the story from, as Germans would say, from an edge. Um, not like uh, from, I, I didn't want it to write about the battlefields in the Second World War or all, all this, um, I mean, facts and stuff we know. And I want, didn't want to become this story kind of heroic um, and um, maybe not even patriotic, not in a classical way. And for me, it was important to show all the battles, not from, yes, not on those battlefields, but like inside, inside the people and how all the um, history and everything that happened in this cruel 20th century, how it impacted the lives of the women. And I don't think that they struggled less or they, um, their battles were less worse than of men. Um, even, I don't mean it like in the military way, um, of course, and emotional and all the losses and all the, um, and of course the price they had to pay um, has always been much higher. And what you mentioned with this um, broken dreams and wasted talents, it always uh, made me sad. It was something that I often still often find in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And many women have to leave, I mean, the, the, whether to Germany or to Greece. Or there's yes, it's still, it's still a really big issue and really traumatic issue. And um, those women, I always want, wanted to write a book about them, but I 
cannot really dare because it's so painful. Um, they still, I mean, a lot of them, are, they don't have papers or legally and um, cannot even visit their families who um, they support from years and years and years, like yeah, from the United States or Greece or Italy and so on. And doing really, really hard nursing jobs. And um, it's, it's such a like Greek ancient tragedies you could write about these biographies. And of course, it's really, really sad that they still have to pay such, so, yeah, such prices. Thank you. I, I just want to remind people that um, we're speaking live to Nino Haratishvili. And so please send your questions in if you have any for, for a little later on. I also wanted to ask you, Stasia and Sopio become involved. And in this novel, passion between women and passion between men is a kind of recurring theme through different generations. I wondered what interested you in those storylines, because I was thinking a little about Hertha Muller's The Hunger Angel, as I, mm -hmm. I was reading. Um, and also, do you see that attitudes to sexuality, sexual freedom, are kind of fault lines in Georgia today? What's your view of that? It's an important question. I have to, I mean, it's not easy to um, answer it um, because there are so many factors that so many, I mean, so many um, details. Um, um, Somehow, of course, love and passion, I mean, they're like deathless themes and I'm always interested in them. I'm from theater and I like this big dramas and um, I like this um, contributions and um, I'm always, I've always been interested in this um, uh, intimate relationships between uh, people, between men and women and women and women and men and men and so on. But of course, it's, um, it's, it became a really important social issue um, in the last years because I grew up, my generation was like torn apart between um, this really traditional way of living. Um, and it's interesting because my generation, I think, was much more conservative than the generation of my parents, for example, the 70s and 60s. And, more conservative. Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, um, maybe it's something that also um, it's in Germany. It's also history is repeating. It's often this way. I don't know why, but um, and I think um, it was the sexuality was, of course, it was a taboo also in Soviet Union. Uh, there was also this um, really popular saying, I mean, it's really funny, but um, we don't have sex in the Soviet Union. Um, I don't know who said that, but it was like on a TV. Um, and like everything, every, every main and important personal and individual issue was like behind the curtains. It's, it was the same with sexuality. And of course, I don't know, people did everything <laughs> as they do uh, usually, but it was always like behind the doors and quiet and we don't talk about it. Um, and um, then this uh, special Georgian traditions, like, you know, this, I always, I grew up with always, this word was always like on my mind, the thing with honor, honor, family honor and so on. And of course, as a teenager, I hated it because I, what is it? So why do I always have to defend someone's honor uh, because of my like sex of my, because I'm a girl. Um, and, but still there was also longing of becoming like more free spirited, open-minded and um with uh, internet and globalization of course things changed really rapidly and the younger ones are completely western orientated if you talk right now if you go to georgia and talk with a 20 years um, old boy like in tbilisi i guess it's really familiar with a 20 year old one here in berlin for example but um this part yes the sexuality was always um maybe it is also part of this process of 
um, getting back the rights, this, um, the personal rights of like, I don't know, this per, um, pursuit of happiness, <laughs> if you, yeah, as Americans would say, um, uh, that it's not something that like the state or something, some instance from above is also regulating for you, but it's, it's your right. And um, I'm positive about it. It's in Georgia it's changing really a lot. And for example, two years ago, there have been this um, um, attacks on the nightclubs. Uh, it was like a drug razzia from the police, but it was not only about it. And so many young people just, they came out and they, they, they was hold this huge demonstration and they raved and danced and, um, I, I was really um, astonished and touched because I thought, okay, things are really, really changing and they want their rights to also LGBT rights and uh, women's rights and so on. These issues become more and more important and um, kind of, um, um, yes, people start talking about that and um, talking openly. And, but um, I see and I always feel when I'm in Georgia, this gap between the generations and it's something that um, it will last and this um, has to be like, um, it needs a lot and a lot and a lot of uh, patience and discussions and talkings and also like, of course, information. Um, because this gap still there and remains and it's, um, it's difficult um, because like the grandparents generation, parent generation and the um, younger ones, it's like, like three worlds um, colliding and um, it's always, um, of course, there are a lot of conflicts. Mm -hmm. Well, I should also tell people um, that uh, David Gabunia, um, a wonderful writer, is going to be speaking uh, in the tavern on Sunday about strong men and masculinity. <laughs> with Mark Gavissa, who um, is the author of The Pink Line, The World's Queer Frontiers. Um, and also um, there'll be a discussion about uh, Georgia's pioneering women in the arts on Saturday with Nana Ektamishvili and Tamta Malashvili. So leading on from many of the things you've been talking about. Wow. Um, the characters' lives are in, enmeshed as well with world events. You, you're putting not just Georgian history into this novel, you're putting Georgia back into world history um, with the, from the siege of Lan Leningrad to the Prague Spring I, I, and so on. Do you see as Georgia as having been removed from this larger history by the Iron Curtain in 70 years? And I also wondered how you see the characters longing for chocolate, for Viennese chocolate, which mm. is, seems to me in the novel very much this longing for the, for the West or Western Europe. I mean, you mentioned this picture gallery and um, it, was how it, um, it, it was today in this, um, I, I think Guardian, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I ha also had a look at it. And every time when I um, see some photographs from that epoch and time, it always, I can even smell this completely, <laughs> like <laughs> complete different, different kind of, um, um, I can even feel this wind, um, something's changing, something's happening. Um, and it, uh, for me, in my imagination, it was all uh, like a chance, a big promise, this short period. Uh, but um, yes, um, you, we, we've talked before, you talked um, in the beginning of our conversation and somehow I always imagined it as a chance, as something, okay, now it's, it's the, this country, this nation, this place, the time is like, it opens like a door and um, some new influences and possibilities and chances are like coming in. But then this door was closed, like really harsh and for a really, really long time. And all the people with all the plans and dreams and um, yes, they paid really, really um, high price and a lot of them even yeah, they did not survive. So I always thought that um, this 
period because a lot of artists um, uh, they studied in Europe. A lot of people, uh, not only in not only artists. I mean, uh, doctors and also people who went in the politics. They um, had they got the education abroad and came back to Georgia and started to change a lot of things. And that's why maybe I wanted to start this book with this a little bit nostalgic, really a kind of old fashioned bell epoch um, European, I don't know, longing or dream. Um, start this book with something really sensual and Chocolate is something that most of the people like, of course, uh, with, a, with a dream that fades away or is, uh, that, yeah, it um, cannot be dreamed like um, till the end. And because I knew that afterwards um, everything would become yeah, gray and harsh and brutal. And um, I wanted the characters to have this dreams because it was like a red line uh, going through the book and it's also my personal imagination when I think and I look at these pictures um, I see this free-spirited um, experimental people how they look like and um, how they uh, stay or maybe also face the future and it's so promising and I always want to like scream some one century, like from this century to back to that, um, that they have to um, maybe flee or um, try to um, enjoy this moment because I always feel almost personally, um, even not, even I don't know these people, I mean, but somehow it feels like even if they were my family members and with knowing what is going to happen afterwards, it makes me um, sad. So that's why it was important uh, to have this sensual issue and this, this main um, theme with dreams because um, sometimes it's a trap, but sometimes it was also a way of um, surviving for them, for the characters in my book. Mm -hmm. um Nisa's um, great great grandparents have this um, this argument, this running argument, and this contrasting view towards Russia. Um, and she refuses to speak Russian. The the, the Nisa does, um, or the great the great great grandmother. But the novel is very clear, and you've talked about this a little just now, about um, it's not just about victimhood, Georgian history, it's very much also about collaboration. Can you explain that? And also, how do you see those conflicting attitudes towards Russia playing out today in, in today's Georgia? Um. I mean, I was always wondering, even as a young girl, because of course I was growing up with all the stories of people disappearing and uh, some people like parents of my grandparents um, sent to Gulag and never came back or people being executed and so on. And every, but almost all the stories that I was listening to or um, people were telling, of course, it was from this victim perspective and point of view. And I was always wondering, okay, and who were the executors? Who were the punishers, the predators? Um, and in Georgia, we never talked about them. And of course, they were also Georgians. I mean, hundreds and thousands of people working for the system. And some of them even were completely, they did believe what um, in the system, it was not only like collaboration, even when the Bolsheviks came, there was also a huge um, um, group of people who um, wanted and helped them. And um, when I started my research and I worked a lot of in archives in Russia, I discovered so many Georgian names among this NKVD people. Um, so this is a dark chapter. We don't like to talk, but I think we have to. And there is also 
So I've been for the last uh, years, a lot of discussions about like revealing the names and opening up the archives, but still it's, um, I mean, um, still it was not, um, it didn't happen um, because in Germany, like in Eastern Germany, they did it and everyone could go and have um, like see their own, um, yes, all the documents and all this, um, Stasi um, stuff. And I think it would be important to talk about that and also start not only this position of uh, victims, because of course, of course, there have been uh, hundreds, thousands of victims and Georgian had the percentage of people who were murdered and um, became victims of the regime, which was incredibly high. But um, still, we also have this other side um, of the history, the other chapter. So um, this is something um, it's really difficult to talk about in Georgia. Um, and one fact that really makes me mad, <laughs> even now we still have the Stalin Museum. And I mean, it's, it's like, um, it's, it's a museum that was built in the 50s and it remains same. I mean, I'm completely I would say we have to um, have this museum, but it has to become a completely different one. Um, it has to become a, a museum of history. And of course, of uh, uh, we have to talk about all the victims, but also all the um, perpetrators. And I think um, that it's still we, dis we are talking about that, but it doesn't really change and nothing's happening. This is something um, that shows that we're not completely, um, yes, we did not really deal with all that in an appropriate way. Um, and yes, of course, I mean, you have it in everyday life, all this um, issues with, you mean, um, when I got it right, you mean the Russian the relationship between Russia and Georgia, right? Um, how different Georgians, I mean, it's not simply um, Georgians against Russians by any means. It's, it's <laughs> have very different views on, on that very old relationship with your, with your neighbor. It is, it is really, really difficult, of course. And it remains, it's, it's like still like a ticking time bomb and you never know when it's going to explode. And 2008, for example, I went to Georgia for a vacation and the war started out of nothing. It was like, what? Yesterday we had a feast and I had, a, uh, we were sitting all together with my family and on the next morning there was a war between Russia and Georgia. So people live with that fear. And I mean, in the beginning, Natasha also mentioned this creeping border problem. Um, and it's also something completely crazy that they're removing these borders. But um, you also have this in all, everyday life. For example, some years ago, I was, um, I was walking on the Rustaveli Boulevard uh, because I also don't have the, you, I don't always have the answers how to deal with that because for example, I love Russian language. And for me, it doesn't have to do anything with Putin and the politics, but of course it depends on context. And for example, yes, some years ago I was walking on um, um, Rustaveli Boulevard and there was a Russian tourist, a lady. And um, it was like 25 years um, after the 9th of April, a really tragic day in Georgian history. And people were standing there with flowers and it was like a small demonstration. And the lady came to me and she asked me directly, like in Russian, so what is going on here? But without saying hello or excuse me. And it was kind of so self-evident that she thought I have to answer her in Russian. And I did it like, it was my instinct and I do speak Russian. So of course, and I didn't really think what I was saying, but I thought, um, I said, um, yes, that is like um, the remember, we, people are remembering the 9th of April when the Russian soldiers 
killed Georgian people. Um, and she got a little bit confused, but after, um, and she went away and I stayed there and I didn't, I wasn't really, I thought, okay, something about that situation made me angry, but I don't know why. Of, I knew, of course, it, it has to do with this language. For me, on the other hand, I mean, it's no problem. Of course, I, I speak Russian, so I, I, of course I can do and answer in Russian. But it was so kind of arrogant and it was natural to her that um, I do have to answer in Russian. And it was a little bit sarcastic or maybe uh, ironic that she was asking me what was going on there. And it was about this uh, really tragic day and chapter in Georgian history. Um, so, you know, it's, it's also in details, like people are discussing some, because we have a lot of uh, Russian tourists and the Georgian economics, um, as this economical problems, they remain so huge and uh, poverty level is still really inhuman. And of course, people are, they're depending on them. And um, so the hospitality in Georgia is still important and I really do I'm happy that it is so and there is not this open aggression like I remember as a child we always went to um, Estonia or the Balticum and there even in it was in the beginning of 90s people when you ask something Russian people were like war so they were getting mad and um, that is not completely the same Georgia and I'm happy that it is uh, not this way but still I don't even I cannot even always find the right answer how to deal with all that. And well, yeah. I'd, I'd actually, I actually have a question here that's about Russians. So I'd like to put that to you. Um, it's from Tamana and she says, which, which European authors would you say influenced you when you were growing up? But did you read foreign literature in Russian translation or, or were you reading in Georgian? Um, half, half, I guess. Um, my, I, I was, um, I mean, I was poisoned by my grandmother uh, with literature. Um, she was like, the, um, she was a huge reader and she had a big library, but she was the generation she studied in Russia and made her diploma, of course, and she had to do in Russian. So she um, spoke Russian to me. I mean, she was Georgian, but still. Um, so for me, it was like really familiar growing up and reading in that language. And she had almost all of her books um, were in Russian. But uh, when I started to discover like writers and literature on my own, and it was like, yes, when I become a teenager, I also started to read books in Georgian. Um, it was always a problem because now it's changing, um, but we had a huge um, lack of like um, recent authors or contemporary literature and everything I could find, I mean, good translations in Georgian, it was always from an, like a writer or author of um, 18 or 19th century or maybe in the beginning of 20s but everything what happened in literature like after 1916 it was a, a big problem to get these books um, and it took a while now in Georgia almost every book um, they're translating a lot a lot of um, also contemporary uh, writers but um, when I was a child or also later, it was a huge problem. So I um, read in both languages, yes. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your, your grandmother. Um, I have a, a question from Bernard who said, reading a book had resonances for me of my parents' and grandparents' lives in Ireland, which is also marking a centenary of its own transformation. Did you draw at all directly on the lives of your grandparents from a hundred years ago? Mm, no, uh, I mean, it's not, um, of course, this book is really, really personal and it has to do a lot of with me or also my family, but it's not like this in this, um, I mean, 
literary way of this word. It's not kind of uh, autobiographical or it's not about uh, experiences my family or grandparents made, but um, there are, of course, for example, like the nineties, this period, um, it was impossible to leave at that time in Georgia and not be kind of impacted by that. Um, and um, of course, my family was also troubling with all that was going on. And we also had all this um, problems like almost every other person um, uh, in Georgia at that time. So there are a lot of, yeah, I somehow it's, I cannot describe it better. It's, it's personal, but it's maybe not private. And Asmat says, I would like to know if the novel has ever been praised or criticized by historians. Um, excuse me, can you repeat the has, question? Has the novel been praised or criticized by historians, people who um, write history, but not, not as fiction? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, there have been some readers who are really into history that they had some remarks, of course, but I don't remember a um, review by uh, someone, somebody who is um, like um, historian. I, yeah, uh, but maybe I don't know it yet. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question um, before, before we end. And that is about, Georgian writers, now so many Georgian writers who I speak to are also translators. Um, they're linguists, they speak many languages, but they also translate literature. And you have translated two novels by Lasha Bugadze, who is in the tavern tomorrow. Mm. Um, uh, you've translated them into German. I wondered what made you do that? Um, it was a kind of, um, it was by an accident, I would say. And um, it was a small test maybe that I wanted to pass because um, I always, I liked Lasha's books. I love his humor and um, I knew him briefly. So um, when I started to translate this first um, book, I mean, not his first book, but my first translation, um, I was, um, I had my promotion tour and pro yes, was promoting the aid life um, through German speaking world and was sitting like every day on a train and I was bored <laughs> and I could not write. So, and I read um, his book, Literature Express, I guess it's also in English. Um, and I had to love like, till I cried um, <laughs> because it is, um, it is a satiric book um, about literature and Europe and Georgia and, and so many things. And um, it was so funny that um, somehow I thought maybe, okay, I'm sitting here for hours and hours. So why not tr to, I, I, maybe I could try to uh, translate some pages um, to see um, if it's possible or would I be able to transport this very Georgian humor into German language. Um, so that was a challenge that I was really um, curious about if I could manage or um, yeah, kind of test that I wanted to pass. So, and I started and I started to enjoy it so much um, that I continued. So it was not planned that I, okay, I start luscious. And even w when I finished, that was, um, I think that was the first time I uh, wrote him or called him and uh, told him that, um, oh, you know what? I translated your book. So how about to talk about that? And he was like, what? <laughs> um, Yes, I had really, I enjoyed it very much. And afterwards, um, then I translated a second novel by Lasha and the third book, it was by Archil Kikodze, The Thousand Elephant, also a book I really, really loved. Well, he, Archil Kikodze is also in the tavern on Sunday. So, we all, <laughs> so we're all here. I'm afraid we're out of time, but I'd just like to thank you, Nino Haratishvili, so warmly for, for that wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, 
and to say that levity and the limits of satire with Lasha Bugadze, Beka Adamashvili, um, in conversation with Claire Armistead, Armistead of The Guardian, is streaming at 18.30 GMT tomorrow, um, after my conversation with Katie Melua at 1800. Uh, free to access and details at georgesfantastictavern.com. Um, I can also reveal that one of the co-translators of The Eighth Life will be singing us out on Saturday as part of Cella, the Cambridge Georgian Choir. So for oh. now, do, speak to, do, do stay with us for the video, Window on Freedom, and the talk, Liberty's Feast and Hangover. Thank you.